When JPM Morgan Chase paid $175 million to acquire a college financial planning company called Frank in September 2021, it heralded the unique opportunity for deeper engagement with the 5 million students Frank worked with at more than 6,000 American institutions of higher education. Then late last year, the biggest bank in the country did something extraordinary. It said it had been conned. In a lawsuit, J.P. Morgan claimed that Frank's young founder, Charlie Cavus, had engaged in an elaborate scheme to stuff that list of 5 million customers with fakery. So your company is called Frank. What's the name behind that? We just wanted to stand for something that was honest, that was transparent. This morning, Charlie Javis could be facing up to 100 years in prison. Accused of, quote, falsely and dramatically inflating the number of customers that the company had. To fraudulently induce J.P. Morgan Chase to acquire Frank for $175 million. They were conned and they bought the con. How in the world does this happen? How does J.P. Morgan, right, one of the biggest, smartest global investment banks out there, somehow not figure this out before they lay down 175 large? J.P. Morgan's legal filing reads like pulp nonfiction with jaw-dropping accusations, among them that Javis and Olivier Amar, Frank's chief growth and acquisition officer, faked their customer list and hired a data science professor to help pull the wool over the eyes of the bank's due diligence team. What J.P. Morgan mostly left out, however, is the story of how Charlie Havis found herself in a nine-figure negotiation with the bank in the first place. Charlie Javis grew up in the posh Westchester suburbs of New York, where she attended the elite French-American School of New York, or FASNI, which provides a bilingual education for children as young as three all the way up to 18 years of age. Entrepreneurship ran strong in the Havis family. Her father, Didier Havis, who is French, has worked in the alternative asset management industry for nearly four decades, including stints at Goldman Sachs's risk management advisory. Natalie Rosen, Charlie's mother, also ran her own business from her apartment in Rye for several years. Charlie Havis's high school resume was indeed strong on extracurriculars. It was at FASNI that Havis developed and created her first startup, PoverUp, an organization that promoted microfinance and helped other students learn about reducing poverty through business. About 50 schools were joining her network every month or month and a half, she said on a podcast in 2011. She said she came up with the idea for the startup while in the 10th grade when she was teaching English in Thailand and Myanmar. Havis also launched a soup kitchen and book drive while at Fesni, according to a local news report from Patch. Havis continued working on Poverup when she attended the University of Pennsylvania Wharton. This helped her gain admission to the school's Venture Initiation Program, VIP a joint incubator accelerator that aims to introduce students to key aspects of building a startup like fundraising, networking, market product fit, and business planning. The Daily Pennsylvanian reported in 2011 that Havis was the first freshman admitted to VIP since Wharton Entrepreneurial Programs began managing the program in 2006. Pulverup also helped her land a spot in the finals of the Thiel Fellowship, a two-year program for entrepreneurs younger than 20 years of age. Winners receive a $100,000 grant to start their companies, according to the fellowship's website. In April 2012, Havis and about 50 other finalists were flown to San Francisco to interview and compete for the prize. The competition, featured on a E20 Under 20 CNBC special in August of that year, featured the young Havis not following directions. The first episode showed a scavenger hunt, where contestants had to work in teams to solve the clues and are told they need to work together. But according to press reports at the time, Havis's team didn't follow the rules and split up to move faster. 
The second episode showcased a pitch competition where founders were given two minutes to present their ideas on stage to an audience filled with founders from the Thiel network, as well as mentors and other investors. The entrepreneurs were directed to stand in front of a podium and speak on a microphone. But Havis ignored the directions, walked to the center of the stage and began talking. For several moments, no one could hear her before she finally moved to the podium. Her pitch lasted longer than two minutes and the organizers turned off her microphone. Later in the episode, the Thiel mentors and members of the evaluation team discussed how Havis initially refused to stand at the podium and seemed to lack humility. Michael Patrick Gibson, who was vice president for grants at the Thiel Foundation, recalled that during the competition, Havis wasn't effusively nice unless you were in a position to help her get what she wanted. According to Gibson, she was a name dropper and liked to reference high status things. Havis was rejected when it became clear she hadn't thought through the consequences of how Pover Up would work. While Havis was celebrating her graduation from Wharton in 2013, she was planting the seeds for her next company, which she incorporated that year as TPD. In an interview on Medium from 2020, she spoke of the attempt at TAPD to come up with a better way to judge the creditworthiness of people just getting started in life. Credit scoring involves complex state and federal regulations, and after 18 months, Havis realized that building a new system and complying with the rules would be too expensive. She was forced to fire all her employees, but later rebranded as Frank. Havis told the student newspaper, The Daily Pennsylvanian, that she appealed her financial aid package at Wharton and was frustrated when it took a semester to resolve. She also said in the Persistence 360 podcast that she considered moving to Canada, where college would cost just $2,000 a year. During her first semester at Wharton, Havis's parents were still in the process of negotiating a tuition price, Havis said in the podcast. She said her case was complicated because her parents were divorced and there were different types of financials. Did Havis receive financial aid? Maybe. The claim grows more credible, considering Havis's father appears to be the main breadwinner of the family, supporting two children, including Charlie and her younger brother L.A. Havis has said she graduated from Wharton in three years while often taking five classes at once. From all of this struggle, another startup was born. In 2016, a message appeared on frankfafsa.com promising maximum financial aid guaranteed. At the bottom was an invitation to join a waitlist. Behind the scenes, the US Department of Education had quickly taken notice. It was not pleased. FAFSA, which stands for Free Application for Federal Student Aid, is a registered trademark, and the department didn't take kindly to Frank's use of it. In a 2018 settlement agreement, Frank agreed to hand its frankfafsa.com web address over to the department. Under the agreement, Frank was to also remove the trademarked term from the titles, handles, and usernames of each and every one of its social media accounts. It also could not use the term Frank's FAFSA anymore, since FAFSA did not and never had belonged to Frank. A Frank co-founder wasn't happy either. Adi Omasi, who served as chief technical officer, sued Havis in Israel over compensation and eventually received a settlement, according to the Israeli newspaper The Marker. All along, Havis was making frequent media appearances, and by 2017 she had landed on the final version of Frank. She wanted to revolutionize the frustrating process of applying for financial aid and this time she was ready to take a big swing. All you need to do is 
is take a picture of the first two pages of your federal tax return and we do all of the financial math for you. So there's no room for error. We help you put together that case with all the supporting documents and we'll be the, um, the liaison between um, the school and you and your parents. Over the next two years, publications continued to shower praise on her. A Business Insider article from October 2018 that appeared on Yahoo Finance had a headline proclaiming, A 26-year-old founder has a solution to what Bill Gates calls an unnecessary roadblock to college, and her startup is helping students get thousands off their tuition. So your company is called Frank. What's the name behind that? <laughs> so when you sit down and ask people who they turn to for financial advice, what do they usually say? So for the demographic between 18 and 26, which was our main demographic and also one that I'm a part of, it's always some crazy uncle. Um, Frank seemed to be really fitting for that. We wanted something to be super approachable, very friendly, somebody that can also speak with authority. And in the student debt world, there's a lot of corruption, a lot of you know squeamish things that are happening and we wanted it to stand for honesty. There's a lot of bad press around student debt. There aren't many good actors in the space. And I think at the end of the day what really mattered was the student and the fact that no one's advocating for them or that they don't really have an ally in this financial aid process. Banks are out there and they're lending because it makes them a profit. Then universities are out there kind of like filling airplane seats where it's yield management. And then the government is subsidizing this whole thing. And no one's really necessarily asking questions. And we just wanted to stand for something that was honest, that was transparent, and where people can really feel as if they have someone who's got their back. We align ourselves 100% with the students. We don't get paid by anyone else other than the family. Schools pay us a lot of money to connect with our students. It's a win for us because we make a lot of money doing it. Frank raised an initial $5.5 million seed round from Aleph in March 2017, and followed up with a $10 million series AA later that year in December, according to Crunchbase. It is with the series A round that she attracted Mark Rowan, the billionaire co-founder and CEO of Apollo Global Management, who led the $10 million round. Other investors included Reach Capital and Aleph. Frank collected a total of $20.5 million through the three rounds of funding. Havis appeared on the 2019 Forbes 30 Under 30 finance list. Then she made the Cranes New York business 40 Under 40 list. Havis has done her homework, the Cranes article said. Not everyone agreed. The next year, Wesley Whistle, who worked at the New America Think Tank at the time, wrote a blog post calling out Frank and Havis for promising help with pandemic relief for students. Even though Frank wasn't working with schools directly and the company's tool might not have been of any use to many students. Not long after that, the Federal Trade Commission sent a warning letter to Frank noting that its purported assistance to students consists primarily of providing a form letter that may lack the information a student would need to apply for one of the grants from his or her school. The agency also wasn't fond of Frank's offer at the time to give students cash advances on their financial aid, with no interest and no fees. According to the agency, the company's terms appear to require the advance to be paid back within 61 days, whether or not the student has received any aid from his or her college or university by that time. Additionally, Frank charges a $19.90 monthly fee. It also offered to help people appeal their financial aid offers for a $144.95 one-time commitment. The company also made a big push to add online courses to its offerings. That was a key element of a November 2019 investor presentation, a copy of which was reviewed by the Times. According to the presentation, students spend $400 billion on tuition, and ethically serving this market gives us access to extraordinary opportunity. Frank's website mentioned classes like Fundamentals of Business Law, 
Customers would pay the company to enroll, and accredited universities would teach the classes. In a prominent spot on its Class Finder page in early 2021, Frank said 448 courses were available from Kaiser University, a 46-year-old school with campuses in Florida that provides many career-focused programs. This was news to Kaiser. The school's spokesman, Jeff LaLiberté, said that the university was unaware that our courses were listed on the now-defunct Frank website. He also stated that the university has no relationship with Frank and has never contracted with the company for services, nor has it ever been engaged in tuition sharing with Frank. Administrators at Lee University, a Christian school in Cleveland, Tennessee, were also unaware of the 317 classes that Frank had listed on its website. Lee currently has only 248 total online courses, and a spokesman, Brian Kahn, said none of his colleagues had heard of the company. According to the investor presentation, the pipeline of schools wanting to do business with Frank was exploding. There were no school names in the slide deck. A small footnote in a hard-to-read color said the company was precluded from providing partner names. References, however, were available upon request. Competitors and financial aid experts were watching all of this, all along, with increasingly arched eyebrows. But they were shocked when J.P. Morgan announced in September 2021 that it was acquiring Frank. Mr. Salisbury, a former director of institutional research and assessment at Augustana College, estimates that 2 million students start college each year for the first time. Having done the FAFSA once, he figured, most families wouldn't seek help from a company like Frank the second time they needed to and beyond. So if Frank had served 5 million people in just half a decade, it would have captured a sizable share of new college students who needed financial aid. Meister Kantrowitz, who had filed the Freedom of Information Act request a few years earlier, was surprised too. He used a web traffic measurement firm to run some searches, and found that Frank had just 67,000 unique website visitors per month around the time of the acquisition. Even if you multiply that by the total months of the company's existence, it doesn't get you to 5 million. As for the claim of helping students at more than 6,000 schools, it's another mystery. The Federal National Center for Education Statistics lists just 5,916 post-secondary institutions that can utilize federal financial aid. Perhaps the company rounded the number up and did business with students from every single one of the schools. The promise of 5 million customers, 6,000 schools. So what could J.P. Morgan have seen in the company? Clearly it liked Havis. In fact, the bank planned to pay her a $20 million retention fee if she stuck around for a stretch of time after the merger closed. If J.P. Morgan wanted a pipeline of soon-to-be-educated young adults, it was paying $1.35 per name. $175 million divided by those 5 million customers. To pay that much, it had to have a lot of confidence that its marketing team would be able to persuade Frank customers to do business with the bank and stick with it for decades. Soon after the merger closed, the bank took its shot and sprayed a portion of Frank's customer list with solicitations. Out of 400,000 outbound emails, only 28% arrived successfully in an inbox, compared with the usual 99% delivery rate. And only 103 recipients clicked a link to Frank's website. It was, as the bank put it in its legal filing, disastrous. An investigation ensued, and the bank dived into Havis's Frank email account. There, it found a litigation mother load. The messages, according to the bank, included copious evidence that she had hired a data science professor to create fake information to prove to the bank that the millions of customers Frank claimed to have were real. 
Highlights from the emails also included a frank engineer's questioning of Havis' data manipulation request. She responded that she didn't think anyone would end up in quote, an orange jumpsuit over it. Havis has, has filed her own suit seeking legal expenses, arguing that JPM Morgan conducted an internal investigation for which it is contractually obliged to cover her costs. The bank's chief executive, Jamie Dimon, called the Frank acquisition a huge mistake on the January 13th quarterly earnings call. That week, it also shut down Frank's website and erased the press release announcing the deal from its own website. The J.P. Morgan Chase lawsuit, at its most basic, is about numbers. The bank claims that Havas said Frank had 4.25 million customers, when in reality, the startup had about 300,000. A prominent CEO in the tech world facing charges. Former Forbes 30 Under 30, Frank founder Charlie Javis accused of defrauding J.P. Morgan of over $175 million. Javis is charged with multiple counts of fraud and one count of conspiracy. The Justice Department accusing Javis of falsely and dramatically inflating the number of customers of her company to fraudulently induce J.P. Morgan Chase to acquire Frank for $175 million. But did the bank's due diligence team include anyone who had been on financial aid to see if the whole thing passed the sniff test? Those are the questions that are still waiting answers for. Havish's saga does appear to be reaching some sort of conclusion. The entrepreneur has held discussions with the Department of Justice regarding a possible disposition of her case. Last month, the entrepreneur pleaded not guilty to securities fraud, wire fraud, bank fraud, and conspiracy charges. She also faces charges from the Securities and Exchange Commission and the lawsuit from J.P. Morgan. Havis is currently free on a $2 million bond. The story of how such a promising young businesswoman could find herself on the cusp of making it big, on track to sell her second startup to J.P. Morgan for a dizzying $175 million, only to have it all fall apart after she was accused of faking a customer list, has left the people that once knew her grasping for answers. What may have pushed her over the edge as alleged in the lawsuit? Was she an Elizabeth Holmes type, determined from the start to pull one over on the world, a striving perfectionist who at a critical point felt desperate and decided to color outside the lines? or just a really young entrepreneur who found herself way over her head. No one is exactly sure. <laughs>